All right, this is JPEG to Raw photo review, show number four. Going over the August photos, and I picked 10 again tonight for AD to give us a critique on. And you know, AD, we were going over, uh, Tim and I were going over the finalists, the, the, the three finalists. And of course, I always think, I hope AD doesn't watch this because I don't do nearly I as good watching. of a job. <laughs> oh, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do nearly as good of a job. But also, you maybe you heard me when I was telling Tim, is what I love about your reviews is you always seem to come from a, a positive standpoint. You know, I have a tendency to see things that are wrong and point and go to the wrong. You have a great knack for saying, here's how we can make this better and having a very good positive spin on it. So I know a lot of people sometimes are nervous about having somebody critique their photos. I would never feel, well, I guess I still would feel, but you should, you should feel more at ease having AD uh, review him because he really is doing it from a standpoint of trying to help and, and give you some, some critiques that will help you take better photos in the future. So with that, let me, show, let me share. If you want to join, this is um, us going over the August photos. But if you want to do the, uh, let me get rid of the lower thirds. If you want to do this uh, next month, of September, which we have just uh, nine days left, you, the easiest way is to come over to our Facebook page, which is JPEG to Raw, which is facebook.com slash groups slash JPEG to Raw. And the album is always pinned to the top. So go right there and you can join that way. There's also a link on our website, which is JPEG to Raw.com. You can go over there and there's a link where you can do it that way. And this month we had two people who did it that way. Most people still do it through the Facebook page. Either way, we're working and we'll get you in there. And I think I picked both the people who did it through the website tonight. So maybe they're not watching us on Facebook, but this will be released later <laughs> on YouTube so you can watch it there. And then, of course, we want to give a shout out to AD and his, his website, the explorographer.com. Um, and he, you know, he's got a bunch of photos there. He's got, of course, his store there, which we'll talk about that later on. Um, and just a, um, a treasure trove of information. And AD's <laughs> gear. I've looked at that a while back. I haven't looked at it lately. but um, I just updated it. Oh, I just updated it. Just updated it. Yesterday, even. Dang. And ready for us. Not the store, but I updated the gear. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. yeah well, the go stores, I got some things. In, I got some things coming. For the store, so sit tight, guys. I got some more stuff coming. Was your update the G DJI Phantom Four? Oh, it may have been. I uh, I had to get my video stuff on there because I haven't like uh, I've had my still photography stuff up there, uh, but I uh, you know I got that new toy and um, man, I am loving it. It's just you know I'm all about creativity, and I think you brought it up earlier about doing the the critiques the way that I do, and you know. Um, uh, an official announcement. Uh, I'm, I'm moving on from the Arcanum. Mm. Um, I, I, I've been uh, with the Arcanum for two and a half years and um, my, my, I'm taking a career change here. So, um, it, which is really awesome and big, good things are happening and that's cool. Um, but one thing that they taught me in the Arcanum is, uh, is this way of critiquing. And it's um, because when you're working on your own work, it's okay to be like as brutal as you want to be because it's, you talking to you and that's fine. You understand what you're thinking in your mind and, and all this kind of stuff. Not many folks talk to themselves in the, the third or second person or whatever. So, um, they, they, you know, there's no damage done there, but when you're working with a student, um, sometimes, uh, it might be their very first time trying a certain type of photography or doing something. So it's really important that you find out what they were thinking, what were they trying to do, what were, what was going through their mind, and then you try to help them achieve that goal because they're coming to you because they're not sure if they've achieved what they've tried to do yet. And so that's why we don't do any of the negative stuff. It's not like a, you know, a, a hippie kind of, you know, love everybody sort of thing, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not that for sure. It's just, um, the Arcanum has developed an amazingly effective way to teach creatives how to excel. And so um, I'm continuing to support them, uh, even though I'm moving on. They're, they're starting to expand and do some new things here coming up. So it's a pretty exciting time for everybody right now. So, um, But if you like what we're doing here, like Mike said, submit some stuff. Um, you know, I was thinking while you were talking, yep. we should you should do a thing – uh, facebook.jpegdaraw.com and then just point it at your Facebook page. It's so easy to remember mm -hmm. instead of all those slashes and yeah, that's make good. It, yeah. 
you could make it a subdomain. Um, but, um, submit your photos and you know, um, these guys will pick them and we'll, we'll get them on the show. And, uh, you know, I was thinking as an added feature, we ought to have people submit photos to the comment section and I'll do like one critique from the people who submit like to the comment section who watch. Okay. So like during live during the show live, we're live. So awesome. I'm thinking, man, right off the cuff, we should do, we should do that. Why not? If you submit a photo during the show tonight, uh, oh, we sorry. will, we will uh, try and work it in. Where I put there my foot right in my <laughs> mouth. All right. So, so before cool. we get started, uh, you, you know, your, your DJ Phantom four is a new toy. I've been enjoying watching you use it on Facebook and Jackie out in the chat right now. I had one question for you, which is, I don't think is here on your page, but she wants to know how's your beer turning out. <laughs> well, I just yeah, I put on my I put on my uh, page tonight. We just had our first glass, and uh, it was really good. It's awesome. Um, it wasn't quite cold at this point, so okay. it was very uh, very European. It was uh, quite warm, um, but it was really good. And I'm and for the first time around, not knowing what I was doing, uh, I'm pretty darn proud of what we did. Uh, my girlfriend Danny and I uh, made it together, and and she helped me make it, and uh, and uh, we're gonna continue on and try some more, even though it was a long, long journey to get a glass of beer. Uh, yeah. It was pretty cool to pour it and see it actually. It's the work. journey that's fun. Oh, it is. And yeah. then, and then of course, when you have it at the end, it's that you know that journey is you made the journey, and it's your beer. Yeah. Yeah, and we did like fifty. We made fifty-eight bottles. I think wow. something like crazy. <laughs> so so we've got beer for a while. Well, so that means that we can take time now to, to make some more and, yeah. you know, we don't, we're don't we not under a deadline. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty cool. All right. Well, let's get started with the first one. And the first one is from um, Angie Snowden, Snowdon. And I actually have their name. I can put their name over it when we do it. So this wow. is not this is not their copyright. This is me. You're going to see basically the same font on every one of them. Just in case I mispronounce her name, you can actually see it. <laughs> <laughs> and pronounce it correctly yourself. Cool. <laughs> Not you, but the the world. Got um, it. So I don't know you. I don't know if you probably can't see what I'm doing, but it's the number I'm one. I'm following so. along at home. You know what? Okay. As they say, I'll follow along at home. Yeah, I got it up. I got her picture photo, or his or hers. It looked like Ange or Angie Snodden, right? That's right. what we're. So um, the the information posted on this was uh, Cameron Lake, and I'm looking over here because I have a screen over here. So sorry, guys, I'm not not dis dis dissing you guys. Uh, this is it's Cameron uh, Lake at uh, Fenelon Falls, Ontario, Canada. It's sunset, uh, August fourth, two thousand sixteen. ISO two hundred f six point seven. It won two hundred fifty of a second and eighteen millimeters focal length. And I don't know anything more than exactly how you took the photo. So. The topic of discussion tonight is going to be what I need from you guys in your photos. So, and this is how it's going to make a difference. I'll explain it to you guys and you can and, and see if this helps you guys. So if you tell me a little bit, Ange or Angie, not sure who, um, if you tell me a little bit about why you took this photo, okay? All the technical information is great uh, for folks who, you know, are thinking about taking a, a sunset photo. But if you're coming to a critique, um, it is... Definitely important for you to talk a little bit about your goal. That's what's super important here because otherwise, I'm just going to tell you what I think. And what I think doesn't mean anything. As a creative, it really isn't going to advance you unless there's something glaringly bad in your photo, which there isn't. Um, so that's the that's kind of the thing behind these critiques that make them extra special. Please post why you press the shutter button. That's right. the most important part. Why did you stop here? Why did you get your camera out? Was it the sunset? Was it the lake? I'm sure it was some of that stuff. Um, and then why did you process it with this white balance or this color or in, in this way? Tell me a little bit about that. Those two things right there, and I can totally help you reach your goal, which is what my goal is here, is to help you uh, – get the photo that you want to get. So, and when you guys are submitting these, remember that's the most important part. You can put all this other stuff too. And that won't mean anything to me. Uh, I love the locations. It's cool. Um, and that's great for other photographers who may want to go there, but we're trying to help you get better here. So, right. um, tell me a little bit about why you press that button. So if you're out there and you're watching and your photo comes up, you can type it cause it's live 
that's what's awesome about this. You can type it, and I'll try to find it somewhere because I'm not finding it right now. But uh, that's, Mike, that's, if you see, that's a great point yeah. because uh, we, you may have to, and I of course will make assumptions on the photo that may be wrong. And if you're watching live, put it in the chat and let us know what AD just said. Why'd you take this photo? What you know? What were you trying to achieve with it? And that will help direct the the critique. Cool. I think I have the right window loaded up. I'm going to try to refresh it and keep it going. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this photo. The composition here is great. The sun um, is going down. I will tell you guys a little secret about sunset photos. Um, when you have a lake that's a little bit more kind of moving around a little bit here, it's a little noisy. Now, it's not noise in the traditional sense like we talk about, like uh, noise from the camera and, and high ISOs and that kind of stuff. What we end up with is a uh, a busy photo where we're trying to uh, create kind of a serene look. So unless you can get that really, those really smooth, big waves that make the, the beautiful lines from the sun, the best time to take a sunset picture is actually about 10 minutes after the sun goes down. And it's not actually with the sun in the photo unless the sun's doing something for you. So when we're talking about goals and things like that, um, you know, an, uh, an idea here is that in this, again, opinion, because I'm not sure what you're going for, but if I was going for a sun uh, set shot and I wanted to get the sun in it, like I really liked the sun peeking under those clouds and I thought it was cool. I would probably, the other thing I would want was I, I would want the water to be a little bit more calm, which it's not right now. It's pretty vibrating all over the place and it's adding kind of a distraction to your photo. It's not bringing that serene kind of feeling forward to me. Uh, I like the tones. I think that's great. Um, and on my one monitor, I'm glad I didn't just stare at my Lightroom monitor because your clouds all look blue, blown out there uh, just next to the tree. Uh, but those look great. Um, so everything looks like it was processed nicely here. I'm seeing a little bit of glow around the tree. Um, so I don't know if this was an HDR photo or not. If it was, you want to be very careful of pulling your highlights back. Um, sometimes what you have to do is actually create an adjustment brush in Lightroom and it only apply those highlights pulling back where you actually need it. Otherwise, like the the stark contrast around the tree and the background sky, which was very bright, causes these halos to appear. So you can see at the horizon line right next to the tree, on it, right almost in the middle of the photo, which is a bad place for it to be because it's very distracting there, you can see like this glow around the leaves there and then you can see it get really light behind the tree which doesn't look natural it almost looks like the color was painted in in front of it so you want to be careful with that um, if it was an hdr i highly suggest checking out 32-bit hdr which creates a more natural look and you don't get the halos as much and you can kind of manipulate the image a little bit more and get it to the way you want if it's not hdr just be careful of uh the clarity slider in Lightroom and the um, and the highlights because both of those can cause these halos to happen, especially in uh, newer cameras. So okay. overall, though, I, I think it's a beautiful photo. I wish I would have known a little bit more about it. Um, I will make one glaring compositional suggestion yeah, um, yeah. is your horizon is right in the middle. And the only time it's really OK to put the horizon right in the middle of your photo is when you have a symmetrical image. So where you have a reflection and the top and the bottom match, um, it's okay to put your horizon in the middle. But generally, we want to keep that horizon at the upper thirds or the lower thirds. And I'll tell you why. Um, right now, what is the story of this photo? Is it the sky? Did you stop because of the sky or did you stop because of the grass? I'm going to say you probably stopped because of the sky. And if you did, then you want to give the sky the bigger part of the show. And that means that you'd want to put your horizon line down at the lower thirds in this and not split this into two different things for the the uh, the person to look at, which is, is what it is right now. There's just a lot of scenes going on and almost too much to look at and, and no real uh, story for me to kind of just sit back and not have a busy mind and just and kind of absorb uh, really, yeah, that beautiful sunset, which I think is, again, the color on the water and up in the sky is really the big thing here for me. And, and is there any issue with the top of the tree being cut off, which would have been fixed by lowering the horizon? Do you have any yeah, problem with that? I, no, not really. Um, the tree is a good point of interest. Generally, I would say that that tree, here's, here's kind of the way that I probably would have looked at it. I probably would have turned the camera uh, 
a little bit more um, towards the left, which is I know sounds really strange, left. but if I would have moved it left um, and, and moved my body a little bit right, I think what it would have done is it would have given me kind of that three object thing that I've talked about before, yeah. odd objects. It would have been the sun, the tree, and that round boulder that's there, which right now is kind of part of the tree, which is a little distracting. It would have put the tree more on the uh, the golden, so right on the third a little bit more. And yeah, by raising it up, I think you would have had, you know, you know, here's the thing too. I don't have the person here, so I can't say, well, was there something to the left that you were cutting out? Because there very well could have been. And in that case, I would have different suggestions uh, based upon that. So who knows? But, you know, the sun right now is in the, is, in, is more towards the third. The sun is actually in a position that if this was a super wide crop, it would be okay. Because generally we bring our thirds in towards the middle when we widen our crop to a right. cinematic look. Um, so this is kind of in a bunch of different places all at once. Um, and they're just a, some basic composition things, uh, uh, rule of thirds. Here's, here's my, here's my thing. Whenever you're trying to figure out a scene, always just start with a basic rule of thirds when you first start. Now get good at that. And then you can start being more creative with that and going to the golden spiral and going to all different sorts of setups. Um, but until you got that, the golden, you know, the golden rule of thirds down to start, I wouldn't try to try to just get wacky with it at that point. Um, it's, it, you know, know the rules so you can break the rules. And I think that once you've got the thirds down and, and you see how much the, how much more powerful a composition is, and I, and we're not going to do it on this photo, but if, if we go through some photos here and I find another one, I'll show you exactly what I mean, how a simple crop can make a photo way more powerful. So yeah, I think it's a great photo. Great start. Just, uh, some basic stuff there to work on. Yeah. Good great stuff. Start, great start. All right. Let's go to the next one, yeah. which is Charles Bush. Hey, hey, Charles. And it, All right. something I, I had to read his write-up on this one because um, this isn't just a simple – there's a little bit more to this shot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have it in front of me if you want to read it. I do. It says it's an orange sulfur butterfly on a Canadian thistle. A thistle. I can't even say that word. <laughs> no, thistle. <laughs> I say it funny because there's a whole story behind it. We won't go into that right now. Uh, but one of my friends who lives in Virginia, if he's watching this, he'll know exactly that story. He's probably laughing to death right now just because I said that. Um, it was shot from a car window with a 150 to 600 millimeter lens about 75 to 100 feet uh, across a, drain a drainage ditch. That's what I have. Yeah, that, that's what I was talking about. Because my, my critique on this one was that the butterfly is out of – I would like to have seen that more sharp. To me, that is mm – -hmm. The, where I'm try, I'm going with my eye on the butterfly, and it's just not sharp. And I understand shooting those conditions, it's probably very difficult to get the butterfly sharp. Um, so it's understandable, but it still it, it still doesn't change the fact that the butterfly is not sharp. Charles, are you out there somewhere? I hope you are. Get out of your car, Charles. <laughs> Walk across the street. <laughs> Walk across the street. Beat your feet. No, it's um. You know, when I when I reading through these, of course, I, again, it goes back to talking about um, the goal. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I read this, all I could get, I couldn't get it out of my head. Like. Are you telling me this because you got a photo of a butterfly from 100 feet away? Because if I didn't know that, then my critique is like, you know, yeah, it's it's a butterfly. It's a little fuzzy. It's I, I agree with Mike on this. I think the the thistle that's on the left hand side is a little bit more sharp than the one that's on the right. Um, and again, we've talked about this before. Whenever you're dealing with plants or objects that are grouped like this, you always want to have three, not two, because two fight against each other all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so you're constantly like, I'm actually looking at the other one more than I look at the butterfly, which. It's just because it's sharper and there's more detail, so right, I want to look right. closer at it, right? It draws me in. Um, don't – you know, it, that's the thing. Um, it's it's one thing to take a shot from that far away and, and that's great and everything. But a butterfly, they don't they don't bite you and um, they don't they don't uh, attack you. They won't they won't uh, take your lens and steal it from you. So um, – and I'll be honest with you. Here's a trick to shooting butterflies. If you see a butterfly on a flower – Go stand at the flower. If the butterfly flies away, don't move. Stay at that flower. That butterfly will fly around 
And it will come right back to that single flower right in front of you because the, the need – they're like hummingbirds. The need to, to feed is so great for them that they know where they got the food. They'll usually come right back to that spot. We have butterflies in our garden and I can chase them all day long and I will never catch them. But if I stand still, they come back to me. I don't, I don't feel you, they had the same fear of humans as, as no. some other insects, you know. So right. you're right. I mean, they'll come back right near you. They'll sometimes land on you. Um, Can you imagine this photo if he would have been like at 10 feet away? Yeah, I, I think. Oh, I, holy cow. Given the circumstances, it actually isn't bad. I I, I mean, I, no, no. I, like no, the, I, I like the image. I like the color, yep. the contrast of the color and everything like that. But you're right. I, yep. I, this is one where I wish it was close up because it has a lot of potential. Right. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's uh, It has nothing to do with the photo. I just... It's something about the, you know, telling me it was shot from the car and everything is not, that's not a plus for me as a photographer uh, and giving the critique. Uh, if you were my student and I was teaching you, uh, I would probably give you a good 15, my students will tell you this, a 15 minute scolding about why didn't you get out of the car? That's just, you know, mm -hmm. that's my thing. Like, um, are you a photographer? If you are, get out of the car, man. Um, you know, and, but still, I think that, uh, it's amazing uh, at that distance with with that lens. It's it's pretty pretty darn awesome. But it's tough to give a critique when you're kind of prefacing it with that. Because I'm not gonna. I can't give any points for that. I'm sorry. That's just <laughs> miss me. Outside <laughs> of the the focus thing, let me ask you this question, Ad, on this image. Sure. Um, with the framing here, uh, would he would he have been better cropping the bottom so you don't have those? Those thistles at the bottom of the screen, the bottom of the image. Um, like you bit, know, I know that way it made of the out of focus a little more. Uh, yeah, they're bokeh. But. They're bokeh out a little bit. I think I probably would have gone with it. So what I like to do with flowers, I think flowers are like people. So whenever I'm taking a picture of a flower, I usually shoot in portrait mode first of all, um, and unless I have some sort of thing going on where I can put the flower all by itself and its subject matter on one side of the photo and give all the negative space over on the other side of the photo as a support system for the lonely flower that's sitting. It depends on the story. But generally, I do like a portrait. And I probably would have done this in portrait. I would have probably blurred out the one thistle that's here uh, below the butterfly on the right that's right on the... Slightly the, in focus. I, I, yeah, I yeah. probably would have just... Um, used a filter on that and just made it look like it was bokeh out like the other ones. And I would have, um, you know, straightened the photo up a little bit and, and tilted it and made it uh, into portrait where it was just one single flower with the butterfly. That's the story here. So you gotta, you know, you gotta be creative a little bit. Um, you were creative with shooting out of your car. So in the post process, you could have pulled the shot off, I think even more, by eliminating the other flower altogether. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I can put this in Photoshop and eliminate that thistle, uh, the other one, mm -hmm. in two seconds with content aware, and you would never know it was even there because it's yeah. that good. And so something simple like that um, would then make this – you could leave it in landscape because then the flower is tilted off in the third, and it's just the, the lone butterfly and the one you know f flower there – and then the negative space to support that. So it's just, you know, again, throwing everything out here and just talking about a good photo, it just comes down to the story and the simplicity of the photo. And there's too much going on uh, on the left to – it's not supporting uh, the rest of the role. I, you know, I heard a funny thing the other night about Ringo Starr and – I always equate music because I because I was a musician long before I was a photographer. And Ringo Starr is the most expensive drummer in the world. It cost one to two million dollars to get Ringo Starr to play a song nowadays. Wow. And it's the thing is, is that this drummer that I watched, he went through and he did this demonstration of a Beatles song, and he said, Listen to Ringo Starr play. And Ringo's playing this simple doom. That's it. That's all he's playing. Yeah. And then he says, now, is Ringo Starr a good drummer? Listen, when I play it, and he played it with all this like heavy, really fast, amazing drummer, drumming stuff. And he goes, so who was better? <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's right. Sim simple, right? It, it fits because Ringo played for the music. He didn't play for himself. Mm -hmm. So when you're taking photos, you want to make sure that your subjects in your photos are supporting the, the, the main stuff.
star of the photo. And I think that was the moth here and the, and the butterfly and, the, and the, the flower. So we don't need that other flower in there. It's not supporting. So let me, for somebody who's new to thinking this way, um, and, and think about you, is this, do you have to slow down and sometimes think through the shot when you're doing that? Or does a lot of this come natural to you now? Well, it's a funny thing. Some of it does. I'd love to, I'd love to sit here and say to you that, yeah, when I go out, man, it's like I'm in another zone and you know, it's just, I see things differently. Um, it's not, I mean, I do see things differently. Anybody who's been out shooting with me will be like, what the hell is he looking at over there? Um, but I don't, um, a lot of times when I'm taking a shot, sometimes I don't see the composition bark at me, uh, the way that I do sometimes it just doesn't always happen. Um, but I usually see it when I'm in post. So, because okay. all the times I'm teaching and stuff, that's all in my head when I'm doing my own work now, especially if I'm presenting it to, uh, another, uh, a student or something, you know, and I know they'll, they'll call me on it if I don't do it right. So, um, so yeah, sometimes it, the story doesn't immediately hit me. And sometimes, I mean, I got stuff in my catalog that's old and I, you know, I will just find it and go, why didn't I see that before? I never, you know, I didn't think yeah. of doing that and I do it. And I'm like, wow, okay. All right. That, that's cool. That's, that works. So yeah, it, I'd love to say it's like that all the time, but it's really not like that all the time. Um, it gets better. And the more you practice, it's uh, like anything, yeah, like anything, it, the more you practice. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is from sure. Daryl Harrington. Yes. And Daryl actually was the winner of the September contest, uh, uh, August contest. Awesome. Yep. Very nice. Well, Daryl says that he had the opportunity to shoot the Milky Way a few times, uh, but now this time was different. This photo was taken at taken at uh, ha, ha, Halikiela, <laughs> somewhere in Hawaii, <laughs> right? Um, which is ten thousand feet above sea level. Um, he saw more stars that night than he ever will again. Uh, I would beg to argue with you, Mister, but um, I would still be inspired by the shot because it's it's awesome. Um, but go to Maine in the dark sometime or Utah, and you will not believe what you can see from ground level. It's just mm. unreal. Those places are so dark. Um, but that's awesome. Um, and then he tells me all of his settings, and then he cropped it down from a larger pano, which is cool, uh, and then some Facebook stuff, and, and he would like people to follow him, and thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, but I don't know why, other than the fact that the clouds are pretty cool and there's an observatory there. Tell me why you, you did what you did in this photo so that I can help you kind of, uh, realize that, or am I getting a photo that, uh, you know, is, is there is no critique to, and if I knew that I'd know where to, where to go from here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the technical side of it because that part of it to me, uh, is, is important. Um, because when you're taking the Milky Way, it's uh, very difficult um, to get the entire Milky Way and everything in the foreground in focus all at the same time. And that's usually because we shoot at f2.8 or lower in order to get the light into the camera as fast as possible. Because to all those people out there who believe that the world is flat, the sky actually moves. Well, and we move too. So all of it's moving. Um while you're taking the photo. So if you go usually anywhere past the, the hard rule is 20 seconds, but if you go 25, it's getting in the gray zone and then 30 seconds, you're really pushing it. And what happens at 30 seconds is the stars move and you end up with these little blur marks everywhere instead of a sharp tack, sharp star. Um, so you want to try to be around 20 seconds. He was at 24, which is fine. A 15 millimeter lens ISO 5,000, which I think is a little high. And when I was in Maine, I shot at ISO 1600 and I could see the entire Milky way color and all. Um, so he did have some light pollution here. So there is some light pollution for, it looks like from a city or something there on the left. Yeah. You can see the city um, because you're up above the clouds in this shot. Yeah. And that's awesome. That's very cool. Um, and I like that effect of the clouds down below. I like the framing here. I think the framing of the, the hill is really nice. Um, but I'm on a, I'm on a calibrated uh, Adobe um, uh, Photo Pro monitor right now looking at it, and I'm seeing an awful lot of chromatic noise in the image. Mm -hmm. So one of the things uh, that can happen to you with noise is you can get some kind of green and different color lights going on within the actual image. And I'm seeing a lot of that here. Now, 
Was that other clouds? It may have been. I don't know. Um, but there's pink in there as well, which usually leads me to believe that there's a little bit of uh, color stuff going on. There is also a couple of stitch errors in it as well. So make sure you're really uh, careful with those. On the left, there's quite a stitch error where I can see double stars. And I know for sure that they're there no stars are exactly parallel so um but that's all i can say it's a beautiful image it's an awesome uh, place i think i probably if i made a suggestion um i would tell um this gentleman to capture the milky way in your pano and then go back and shoot the whole scene again but only shoot for the foreground so make sure that your observatory and everything you're focused on the observatory because if i zoom in on this i'm going to guarantee you that the foreground is out of focus yeah, I mean, because there's can, no way – yeah, 2.8, you can't keep it all in focus. So I think um, you can see that even without zooming in. The observatory is a little yeah. out of focus, yeah. So what we why, the reason why I mentioned that, you're probably like, well, geez, AD, I mean, come on. It's, look at the photo. It's awesome. And it is. It's amazing. <laughs> the reason I mentioned that is because here's what's going to happen, and this already happened to a friend of mine, is you're going to take a beautiful photo like this, and you know what's going to happen? Someone's going to come along to that Facebook page that you want everybody to visit, and they're going to say, dude – I want a 60 inch print of that for my office mm -hmm. and you are going to crap yourself when you can't do it. Oh, Daryl's out, out in chat right now too. So what's going to happen is you're going to blow that up to 60 yeah. inches and you're going to see all the noise. You're going to see all the, all the stuff with, that's out of focus and suddenly it's not going to be as stunning as it is right now. And so you got to, anytime you go look at, if you look at Michael Shane Bloom, he's a, he's a great Milky Way photographer. Um, and you've had several guys on the show too that, that, that do it. Mm -hmm. It's if you look at their, they're shooting the foreground separate from the background and then they're putting them back together so that okay. it'll be that super tack sharp all the way through. And that's what you have to do in order to get these printable. It's a wonderful image. It's going to look good on a website. It's going to look good, but you got to be careful because when you display it to the world and it's a beautiful image like this, somebody's going to want to print. And then they're going to, that's when you're done at that point. And I think from what Daryl said out in chat, he's out there now that, that he left it dark to try and combat some of that out of focus. Um, he didn't say anything about the, doing a composition like, like you said, gotcha. a composite, like you said. Um, but he, so the, the, he, I think he knew that it was a, a little bit out of focus. So he tried to combat it by leaving it darker. Yeah. And I think, and I think that, yeah. And I think that that's, that's good to know for sure. Um, it gives, gives me a better idea. Um, I like the silhouetted, silhouetted foregrounds. I, I always I have, especially in Milky Ways, because, I mean, the story is really in the sky. But you do have that observatory in there, and that is a big, strong part of the story. Um, so, you know, I'm just – this is just a, a top tip for if you want to, you know, um, get in the big leagues. Milky Way – I'm serious. At the end of August, um, if you haven't been on the internet um, – the, that's all there is on the internet everywhere during August is Milky Ways. I mean, I've seen like Milky Ways inside of refrigerators. It's ridiculous. They're everywhere. And, and But if you're going to play in that field, if you're going to go out there, I tell this to travel photographers and landscape photographers, you're going to go out into that. There, there are so many amazing people out there. You got to go full guns blazing if you want to get noticed and you want to get to where you want to get. And I just, you know, you had your comment there, like his Facebook page. It's DH Imaging, by the way. If you want to find him on Facebook, go and like his page. Um, so there you go, Daryl. Um, but I think that um, if you want to get into that realm uh, with those at that level, then just, you know, take my advice and, and make sure you're shooting both the foreground and the background as well. If, if you guys are out there, you follow a, a, a student of mine who's, he's kind of not real, not really a student of mine. He's kind of a co-photographer of mine, uh, Tony Curado. It's C-U-R-A-D-O. He just did the fifth, uh, his galaxy 50 thing where he shot the Milky Way. He's, he's attempting to shoot the Milky Way in 50 States. Uh, yeah. It's awesome. So, it's awesome. He's trying that. He yeah, his project on the show. Yeah, yeah, and you look at it like his first Milky Way shots, and then what he learned along the way, and his final ones are just, oh, they're amazing. That's I, a, you know. that's a, I didn't think about that. So it's not just going to every state, but it's watching the progression of him as he goes yep. to the states. Yeah. So two things I'd like to touch on before we move to the next one is you mentioned sure. uh, Daryl's uh, Facebook page. If yep. you're if you are like Daryl did, if you are adding a photo to our contest and you, you know, are in the finalist or a winner or something like that. And you want to make sure we have your link so we can share it when we post something about it, you know, yep. feel, make sure you put it out there and we will share it when, 
when you in, in with the final images in the fine in the winter also so we can give you some press there two is the yeah the technical things that you brought up here i do i love the thought here and and uh the goal what i see is the goal is the milky way the observatory you know kind of looking at the milky way the fact that we're above the clouds and i can see the city down in what is a valley or something all that just really is a strong there's a strong concept there for me yep absolutely and he's got the story and that's what i want to hear from people i want to hear um are we right daryl i mean it's great that you're in chat and you can tell us but you know put that on your photos when you submit them just a little bit about why you put press the shutter and then why you process the image the way and that just gives me the the fuel that i need to help you reach that uh, height that you want to get at so all right, and I don't know how much time you have tonight because we're moving a little slower than usual, but this is good yeah, stuff. Yeah, this is yeah. good stuff. It's, it's all good. We got 11 <laughs> people hanging out with us, so that's cool. Here we go. All right, so now we're going to go to Gene uh, Boker, and Gene has yeah. been a guest on the show before, and he's a local. Uh, he lives uh, not in my same area, uh, the yeah. Atlanta area. He is a big train buff, and I think rustedrails.com is his, yep. is his website. Yep, rustedrail.com. Rustedrail. Um, yep. Um, and this particular photo was taken in North Carolina at a transportation museum. We have one of those up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, too, called Steamtown, which is pretty awesome if anybody's in that area to take pictures of trains. Um, great subject. Gene, I, I followed Gene for quite a while. So um, this is interesting to critique one of Gene's <laughs> images because I've followed him around. And he's been an ins inspiration to me. Uh, I love trains. Um, I love that era and just um, the things we built back then were just amazing. I think he captured that here quite well. It's very, very difficult in a place like this to single out. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not set up for photographers at all. Um, so this is a difficult image as far as composition goes um, because of the extra car and the uh, – it looks like a coal hopper that's there, and then you got signs hanging out, and you got a step stool in there. I probably like the little things in this image. I might have removed like the sign and the little yellow. The the little yellow yeah. post is kind of a little bit of a distraction for me, um, and the stool I would have taken out. All all of those images, those little things in the image are kind of distractors um, that take away from the feel of this beautiful steam engine and the art deco look that it has we want to concentrate on that we don't you know we want to believe when i look at his images i want to believe i'm in that era i want to believe that that train is running right now and and you know i'm sure it is it looks like it's got coal in it and everything but i mean i want to be taken back to that time and i think that you know you have a stool there and you have the little yellow pipe there and that kind of stuff those things are kind of like telltale you're you're kind of at a you know a different place you're not you're not in that time zone so i would probably think about uh, uh taking those out there's also a bird or something flying in the upper uh corner in the left too that's just part of the old uh, border patrol and and removing that sort of stuff um other than that this it's just little things around the borders the wires on the on the right hand side are a little distracting too um, when we create images, we usually try to keep them as minimal as possible so that the subject matter really uh, overpowers you almost, um, unless you're doing some sort of imaging where you're hiding things in the image, but um, where you have a train, it's like you're right here in your face. Um, simple little things like that, um, you know, can can just make the image, you know, over the top, so to speak. And Gene's work is, is amazing. If you yes. guys look him up on Flickr, he, he's got a great Flickr stream. I'm always over there watching his stuff. So, um, it's a, it's a gorgeous image. It's well shot. It's too bad that the skies didn't, you know, uh, work out for you. Um, but the light is good. It's a little cold. Um, that, you know, when you have a nice blue sky like that, it, you know, if there's no sun or anything, uh, uh, shining down or if the sun was behind a cloud, which it looks like it was because there's no, no harsh shadows. Um, I would probably warm it up just a tad. Um, it looks just a little cold just because of the uh, of the black and blue together. Kinda. What if you went a whole different thing and went uh, black and white? You could. Um, I think that comes down to um, you, that's a decision. I'll tell you what's really funny. Whenever I'm processing images, I generally usually always switch on and off the black and white at least once while I'm working on them. And it's always to tell my brain which is which is more powerful. Are the colors working together to support the image? Again, is it Ringo Starr? You know, is mm -hmm. he is he is he going along with the with the groove? Um, 
in, in this case, I don't dislike uh, the color. The thing is, it's interesting about mentioning black and white. If you did go black and white, then you don't really know if it was a perfectly blue sky because it could have been foggy. And that might like, lead a whole new like vibe to the image. Some people, though, are not black and white people. They just don't like it. They don't use it a lot. And so I, it just I depends think, on what Gene thinks. I think Gene does use black and white, uh, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Yeah, I think he but, does have some yeah. images. Yep. Yep. So he probably did look at it both ways and, yep. and decide he liked this one better. All right, but he's got, you know, he's got his uprights and everything. You know, this is, Gene knows what he's doing. So um, I think it just comes down to just the little things, um, removing a few of the distractions out of the image. Other than that, um, you know, it's a fairly uh, awesome, awesome spectacle for sure. All right. Good job, Gene. All right. Next one is, was this Lewis? I'm not going to be able to say last name. Let me just pull it up. Bar Baraza? Lewis Baraza. Baraza. Yep. Lewis Baraza. All right. Well, this is the statue called The Awakening, and it was taken taken at National Harbor, um, which I'm not sure where National Harbor is at. But um, that's cool. I like it. It's a cool sculpture. Um, you know, the it's a night scene, which uh, definitely a, a good capture at night. It looks like a long exposure, eight seconds. So um, pretty nice. Uh, I think I, I I would have liked to have seen some other stuff done, maybe some forced perspective or something. Uh, and put maybe more of this on the water. I'm not sure that all of the other stuff, again, is supporting. It does look kind of like he's reaching out towards the uh, other building over there, which is kind of neat. But um, this would be one of those um, places where if I had access to it, I would go there and practice a lot, a lot of different uh, for, angles. for power of composition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I don't know, you know, anything about it. I don't know anything about this Im image other than what kind of camera it was taken on and the settings, which, you know, if, if we're teaching about settings, if you, if you're, you know, if that's what you're looking for in a critique, um, you can find that anywhere. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You can find out how to do the settings on your camera, uh, practice. I will tell you, first of all, practice and pay attention to what, you know, try shooting in all different F stops, the same scene, and use different, you know, shutter speeds, and then look at them side by side in Lightroom. You'll learn quick enough what works and what does not work for you. Um, though that's the easy stuff. What I'm trying to help everybody with is the creativity in the image. Um, and this is it. Just to me, um, this was taken on a D750. It could have been taken on a cell phone. It's a kind of just a snapshotty kind of in image. Um, it doesn't it doesn't work for me as far as power or anything goes in the image. Uh, so you have an interesting. Uh, subject here um this is something i would like to see you know if you here's the here's when i come across images like this i always ask students whether or not they uh if this is someplace they have access to lewis if you have access to this place go back and and try all different things different angles different looks at this and 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 maybe you have but keep at it um just keep going with it um because you definitely can capture images at night it's a wonderful job. There's nothing blown out here. The color looks good. Mm -hmm. uh, noise and everything looks great. So I think it's just um, try to come up with maybe something uh, a little bit more interesting for the composition because I think it's an interesting subject. Now just lend your creativity to it, and I think you got a winner. All right. Very so. good. All right, now we're going to move on to the next one, number six here. Yes. This is from Michael, um, Michael Demagall. Yes, uh -huh. yes, Mike. I love. I actually like this image, and it didn't make the final three. But I was very disappointed it didn't make the final three uh, images because I I like the mood to the image. Yeah. So here's a. Um, this is an image where um, reflective symmetry uh, could work um, because you've got this nice glassy water going on. We want to lower our camera a little bit and put that pier right on the horizon line and make sure our horizon is dead on straight. He's got a little bit of pin cushioning going on with his lens, mm -hmm. so it's kind of curving edges, a little bit. Yeah. So I don't know if you're seeing that on your side. I, yeah, I but yep. Yeah, the horizon's curved a little bit. Um, and there's, you know, some – so he, here's the story. Now, I don't have a lot of, with this. It was Sunrise at Huntington Beach, um, so I don't have what his idea was here. Um, other than he would like the sun, sunrise and the colors, which that I totally would get. Um, so I'm just guessing. So we'll go with that. 
Um, but to me, the smooth water in the long, you know, he did uh, an ND, an 11 stop ND filter here, ISO 200, which is odd if you're going to use an ND filter, but okay. Um, it might be the camera only goes to ISO 200 though. So this is a D7100. Um, and he shot it at F8. Um, and it doesn't say how long it says something like T O R number 51, which I think there was yeah. a number there in something. So, but still, um, so if we were, if we're talking about, you know, a long exposure here, we, your effect was what? When you do a long exposure, you're trying to smooth things out. Is that correct? Smoothing the lake out, smoothing the sky out. Yep. Right. Exactly. So with that, we want to, well, why do we smooth things out? Because we want them to look very serene and very calm and very, you know, relaxing. So whenever you're trying to do that, finish off with the, the two little pier thingies or little, um, You've got a couple of markers out there in the water. Yeah. You want to get, take get them right out. Yeah. Take you two seconds. Get rid of those. They're a distraction. They're not lending to the story. Well, I don't want to, you know, they're, they're markers for what? The edge of the water where it gets deeper or where the boats aren't supposed to, you know, so they don't come in that far. They, they do break that, the calm, yeah. Right. That doesn't that doesn't lend to the story. Um, the little rock that's out there, I probably would have taken all of that out. Just simply and made it this nice beautiful surface that he's captured here and the one other thing is is that you've got beach in the lower left hand corner that creates a triangle of contrast in the corner and triangles of contrast tend to pull our eye away from the subject in any image anytime you put a triangle in any corner that's of contrast it will draw your eye away from the subject so here this little piece of beach is not centered and it's not, you know, he, he could have moved a little bit and made the beach kind of go edge to edge and use that round surface kind of to help yeah. a little bit and seem like you're on an island and looking at the serene uh, light. But the way it is now, it's only in the corner and it pulls your eye over that way quite a bit. The colors, amazing. They're beautiful. The long exposure, absolutely. 110% long exposure, man. You You hit that right on the head. But it, now it comes down to just getting the composition a little bit. The reason why I recommended the pier and moving the pier, uh, lowering your camera, which would have moved the pier blocks upwards or the breakwater, it would have moved it up higher, is because if you look there on the left, there's a piece of land sticking out. Okay. And again, we want to find it. We were like, well, what is that? What is that over there? You know, um, and that takes us away from in just taking the whole photo in. If we're going around a photo and we're trying to figure out everything in the photo, we're not actually seeing the whole photo. We're seeing little parts of it, which means that there's a bunch of little photos within your big photo, yeah. which is what you try to avoid. Could If he didn't do that, could he have just cloned that out, that little area out that you're talking about? You could. It would have been very difficult, but he see how he has his horizon going above the pier? It would yeah. have been much better to hide that okay. and use that as a leading line out to uh, the beautiful okay. sky yep. that he has out there. Yeah. And and then again, Gosh, he could have – yeah, and he could have um, – he could have put the horizon in the middle here yeah. because that – because he has the reflection, it would have been a symmetrical image which is okay Okay to put the horizon in the middle. If not, he would want to, um, you know, in this image, uh, and, and for the sake of time, I'll just tell you that you could actually pull the crop up on this, put the horizon in the third, and I could clone out the entire beach and make it look like water, and you'd never know that it was there. And if I, and maybe I can do that and post it, and then you can see how what the power difference is when you look at the two side by side. But I think that just, you know, in a case like this, if he lowered his camera a little bit and got a little closer to the water and just made it water, pier, sky, you have those three magic elements that make a very strong image that it's about the color and the, and the sereneness of the image. So Very good. All right, next one up is uh, Millen. And I think we've had yes. images from Illa in the last last three shows, maybe. Yes, we have. So this is a uh, cloudy sunrise, a sun raised uh, on the 12th of August with some interesting clouds. Um, let's see. And he tells me about a mountain that's there. Uh, and this is in Bulgaria, by the way. Uh, it is a panorama of six vertical images stitched together. This is good information there. Um, I like to usually know if images are true panoramas and not cropped. Um, I can talk a little bit about that too with this image. 
Um, do, 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 do opportunities. I'm just skimming through here to find any information. Uh, he says he likes the show. Yay. Yes. Awesome. He, he's in, he's really, uh, enjoyed your feedback. Awesome. Um, so I, he's going to hate me tonight cause I'm going to say the same thing I said to everybody else. <laughs> Please tell me you know, more about why you took the photo. Um, so I can understand a little bit to helps me get in your head a little bit and, and, and just help you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about panoramas. Um, keep in mind when you're cropping something, if you're not shooting on a monster, like hundred megapixel beast or a 42 megapixel beast. Um, if you're shooting on a standard camera, say at 24 megapixels and you crop too much, someone's going to see a beautiful photo and want to print it and you're not going to be able to make it very large for them. Um, so be very careful with that. If you're going to go panorama, shoot a panorama and then, you know, you can always like you get enough megapixels, you can crop it any way you want, which is always fun. Um, and that's what he did here. Uh, he shot six verticals, which is the proper way to shoot a panorama like this. Um, there's kind of a couple of building silhouettes on the side. They're kind of cool, um, but I can see a little bit of detail in them. So they're kind of treading that uh, they're treading that line between is it, is it a silhouette or is it a am I supposed to see the detail here? It's a very dark image, obviously. Um, so is the image creating a dark mood? Um, if so, I'm not quite getting that from it. I mean, it looks nice with the the sun setting, but it almost looks like, you know, he said it's a sunrise. So if it's a sunrise, do we want to make it a more uplifting image? Um, so, you know, that sort of thing, or do we, are we posting it as a, a dark image? So we're making the image all dark and it, and that makes me think sun setting. Okay. If that makes sense to you. Um, and kind of a dark image will end up, um, you know, being very foreboding which this image is kind of the color process says one thing, the contrast says another thing. Um, so I'm not real, I'm kind of torn between those two in the image. And, you know, beyond that, there's little things like the little radio tower that's there off to the left, which is kind of taking away from your beautiful clouds and your sun. I don't, you know, take the radio tower out, take the little wires out. It takes two seconds to do. Um, and other than that, there's no other distractions, uh, other than the buildings on the side. And he balanced those out nicely. Um, whenever you have anything like buildings or mountains uh, coming into a scene from the left and going out of the scene, I think Daryl's image did this very well as well. Um, you always want to make sure those are kind of level in the image. You don't want to make the image feel like it's tilting to one side or the other. That's a distraction in itself and lends tension to the image. So this is nice. The mountain is nice in there. And I think it's a very interesting image and I can't really go into too much critiquing on it to help you out, uh, Vaskov, because I don't know uh, what you were going for. So, if, you know, if – Go ahead. If, I think if he wants to – here's the thing. Anybody is free to contact me on my page um, and find out more about your image. If you if you want to you know, get a hold of me and say, hey, um, my image was this one and this is what I'm going for. What do you think? And do you have any ideas? I'd be more than happy to, to uh, you know, expand on what we're doing here. I know we're supposed to keep these pretty quick. So No, that's good. That's good. It's, it's very helpful. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll just move on, move on to the next one. This is a guy I'm, I'm becoming a fan of because he's he's entered the last uh, few, and I just love the mood of his images. Rolf um, R O L F. Let me get his name up there. I can't remember where he's at, but I think it's I'm going to say it wrong, but I'm just going to say Norway. I think it's somewhere over in that area. If I got it wrong, which I probably did, <laughs> forgive me. Um, wherever you're taking photos, it looks like a place I want to visit, though. Absolutely. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, it, and here's a good example of what we were talking about before. The the horizon is more in the middle. There's some good reflections going on, but not quite enough though to make it a symmetrical image. So I'm I'm torn in this image. It is interesting because I think you and I find it interesting mostly because we're from the United States, and yes. this doesn't look like any place in the United States. Yeah. Um, but uh, if you really want to take the image over the top. Decide whether or not the sky or the water or the mountains or the pebbles on the beach, what is your subject? Okay. If it's the whole scene, then your job as a creative photographer is to make it all work together. And that's very difficult. So, um, you know, if, if you're not sure how to do that, I would pretty much start with singling things out and kind of going that way. 
Um, it looks like you had beautiful light here, um, and it fades off more to the to the right as you go, which is great. Um, this does look like an HDR image, and the only reason I'm going to say that is um, it was a 30 second exposure, which may have caused uh, the water to. Lo it looks like the water was either very rough or this was HDR, one of the two. Um, and what happens when we do like a long exposure uh, HDR is we'll end up with this kind of grainy uh, looking water. Um, if it wasn't HDR, then I would probably consider uh, slowing down a little bit on the process uh, just in the water areas. So um, I always see like a lot of water images where the water is very noisy or very uh, – it has a lot of movement in it when they're trying to portray it being very smooth. Um, and, you know, we do the long exposures to, uh, to kind of get that ghostly feel, which I think that has a little bit of that in the shoreline, which is cool. Um, but there's just there's so much going on in this photo um, between the, the sunlight on the left. And that's gorgeous. And then we got two rocks that are kind of away from each other. I think uh, one rock would have been great here uh, without having the second rock in there. Um, and still gotten the sun, sun in this and, and all of that. Maybe a little bit of the shore. Um, generally, when we have a shoreline like this, we want to kind of try to keep it e as even as possible. It's very much moving. So when we look at an image, depending on which way the, the lines are going in the image, that's the way our eye usually goes. Um, so I'm not finding a clear composition uh, in the image. It's a gorgeous place, and I'm, I'm overtaken by I don't recognize it, and it's nothing that we get to have around here. Yeah, right, but yeah, the mood of it got me. The one thing you, I don't think you mentioned this that, that distracted me the most mm -hmm. was I think the effect on the clouds from those long shutter speed. They almost look like, uh, you know, and sometimes you see in a movie where they have this weird effect they do to clouds that almost make them look flat or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and that, yeah. that's kind of the effect I'm seeing with the clouds, which I'm sure is a byproduct of the long exposure. Yeah, and that's uh, an interesting thing that you brought up, and I'll talk really quick about that too. When you're doing long exposure, there is a certain weather event that you can shoot at when you get uh, to get the the water that looks super smooth, and then get the clouds that move that look super smooth. It looks like these were like stratocirrus cloud clouds are a little bit higher. They're not cumulus clouds, which are generally lower, and they move a lot faster. If you shoot the same scene with the cumulus clouds. And they're moving very fast. You have a much more dramatic image yeah. because those clouds are clearly drawn out. And I think what Mike is alluding to is they kind of just look blurry because they're not really drawn out. They're mm -hmm. way up high and they're not moving very fast uh, the way everything else is. So your only choices are A, to wait until the clouds get lower and, and they're moving faster. So um, that's one option. The other is to shoot uh, a sh like F-22 – Put on the 11 stopper and, you know, seriously like three, four or five minute exposure so that you really get those clouds to move. So it either it shows the movement or doesn't. I, I had a bunch of photos like this. I learned this the hard way. I was out west and I, you know, I thought I was, oh, the sky's gorgeous. This is going to look really cool when I do the long exposure. And it didn't. It, the clouds didn't have enough movement in them. I ended up having to do the movement myself in post to get it to look that the way that I wanted to. Um, so it is a very uh, specific situation to get that cloud movement when they're low and, and moving fast. So, all right, all right. Our second to last one. This is I love fog photos. I've just never been able to take a really good one. I always <laughs> it's like when I get it in the in start post process and I want to defog it. <laughs> and so yeah. I I but I love uh, fog photos. So I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this one. I don't know how well, well the I, name's going to show up when I put it on there. But this is – sorry, this is from Mark. And Mark is yep. one of the guys who didn't enter it through the Facebook group. He entered it through our, um, our webpage. Awesome. Yes, yeah, a calm and relaxing uh, picture. Bird in flight. Uh, it's – let's see. Let's see. The bird in flight is just maybe the little extra as it too is the beginning of the day or beginning of its day. So this is his first submission uh, to the contest, as yep. you said. Um, very cool. Uh, if this is So this is a good example of reflective symmetry. Um, and the only thing I would say is that the, the issue with reflective symmetry and uh, it's got to be symmetrical. So right now 
uh, because the the pond that you were shooting at was curving around to the right of you, Mm -hmm. uh, it tends to droop down on that side. So if you squared yourself up to that a little bit more and made it even, that effect is a lot less. So then you get the perfect symmetry of tree on top, tree on bottom, and all that kind of stuff. And the line is very razor straight. And what that does for you is that just gives you another sense of wonderment on this beautiful foggy scene and takes this kind of downhill feeling that it has of sloping down quite a bit on the right. Now, this is something that someone's going to look at this photo and they might not know what it is that looks or feels a certain way. They might not be getting the wonderful feeling that you got when you were there. That's that's why we remove some of these little distractions. So if you know if you get something like this again and you're going to shoot it again, make sure that you square yourself up to that opposite bank. And then sometimes you can move a little lower as well, and that will also help unbend that line a little bit. The lower you get to the water, the more it doesn't curve around, and then it kind of looks like it's sloping down to the one side. It's wonderfully taken, wonderfully exposed. I love that the tree is darker in the water yeah, than it too. actually is – uh, up on top. I think that is a really cool effect. I will say um, that that is probably generated in post. And I question that the bird is generated in post as well, um, because the bird apparently is a vampire and doesn't have a reflection. Or the reflection could be hidden in the bushes. Nope. Nope. That wouldn't work that way, I don't think. Because unless that bird is way out in the middle of the field, and then why didn't the fog affect the bird when the bird is so clear? I don't know. <laughs> I do a lot of I do a lot of compositing and I I run into like whenever you do something like this if the bird was there and something got erased um that it just makes you wonder like you know why is the bird coming out clearer than the tree is if the guy, if the bird is parallel with the tree and there's fog in there which I can see on the ground then the bird would be kind of fogged out a little bit as well if you post process the bird and the bird is way back there I'd probably add the upside down reflection just to sell the image so I don't think it's selling for me with with that the way it is and it's perfectly fine to do I am perfectly fine with compositing and doing all that kind of stuff to create and generate the mood and if he didn't do that that's great as well um, that's fine it's just that it's interesting that there is absolutely no bird anywhere uh, in the reflection of the water. And I would say that the angle that he's at, um, I can see everything else out there. I can see, you know, these trees and stuff. So I, I would say that the bird is up high enough I could see it. So I just, I, you know, this is why I, this is why I'd love to hear from yeah. them when they post the image that I'd love to hear that extra stuff because I don't know, you know, and, those and, would be all the things I talk. Like, in, and like AD said, if, if this was a composite, there's no problem with compositing. That's fine. I mean, you're not a journalist, but just you might want to, right. mention, might want to mention that. And, and there's a tip that if you did composite, something you can do to add to it. Absolutely. And and creativity is, I'm all about it. So um, you won't ever, you know, I don't believe that somebody should take a clear sky night that didn't have the Milky Way in it and paste the Milky Way in it uh, and not tell people that's what you've done. I've seen a lot of people do that. And they'll post the image and say, I was so lucky to capture the Milky Way right in between these two buildings, you know, in the middle of New York City. And you're like, no, you didn't. <laughs> and, and Mark just posted – don't. it's not showing up in our chat here. He posted no, where I shared it at in our Facebook group. He said that the bird is in the pic, uh, not okay. added in post. And he okay. thinks the reflection must be hidden somewhere in one of the other shadows. Mm. And he's, he's thinking it's in a dark reflection of the bush. Yeah. I I just it's just kind of one of those things when you look at it, though, you have to think to yourself, you know, was there other frames? Did he get it with the bird? Because the bird looks like it's either flying towards or away. I can't really tell. But was there an image where the reflection was there? Okay. Um, you know, when we're dealing with symmetry like this, I think that's the main point here, I guess, that I want to make sure that Mark understands not picking on the image or anything like that. But whenever you deal with symmetry, it's an all or nothing thing. So you've got all this other stuff that's symmetrical except for the bird, which does, it seems like, well, everything has a reflection. Why doesn't the bird have a reflection? So it just, it pops up for people when they look at stuff and that, that will just be like, you know, um, what, what exactly is going on here? It isn't, they're not, they're not in the image for the mood anymore. They're suddenly trying to analyze it and we don't want to let, we don't want to give them that opportunity to analyze. We really want people to look at the images 
and get in that scene with us, right? That's what we do What we do it for. Let me ask you a general question about fog photos. Because, again, I, I mentioned when you started on this one, I love fog photos. Yeah, me just, too. I have never got as good of a one as, as Mark has here. Um, any any quick tips when you go to take a fog photo, what to, you know, what to think about? Uh, get up early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go to work that day, Mike. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, eventually the fog will burn off, so then you can go to work. Right. Oh, you know, so fog is an interesting thing. I've gone to take fog photos. I look out my back door and went, oh, the fog, I'm going to go. And I get down to the pond or where I'm at, yeah. and all of a sudden there's no fog. Yep. I've had and that I'm happen. Like, Dude, what's up? But then if you would just wait 20 minutes, the fog comes back because it moves. And fog is just low moving clouds. And a lot of times it'll just disappear for a little bit, and then all of a sudden, boom, there's more. It comes back again. Um, as far as settings go, I mean, it's you know they're pretty pretty easy to do. I think I think the thing is with fog is you you got to shoot multiple frames um, because you you know the fog clouds will move through. Some yeah. of them won't have the right contrast, um, and no matter what you do, you're not going to really get uh, you know you're not going to get that look the way that you want. I think he captured that moment. Well, I'm I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. This is the my favorite photo in the group. Oh, so, okay. You put that out there ahead of time. Um, that I love the mood here and and that whole part of it. I, I think that you know, like I said, the things that I'm talking about are just very simple uh, things uh, that you know you got to you, when you're putting out an image like this, you got to be very careful with. And and since I've told you it's my favorite photo, please remove the dust spot below the tree on the left. Please. Dust spot. There's a dust. There's a dust spot in there. Ah. Oh. My my yeah. monitor has several marks on it, and I can't. Sometimes I lose track of <laughs> is that me or him. So my students hate me for, for dust spots. I see them, and it, I, I am like I have released images and then had to take them back down because they had one dust spot, and I get all upset at myself. <laughs> Dang it! Just it. Yep, and it's this is a nice clean image. It's nice and very mm -hmm. clean. So you always want to do your border patrol and make sure you don't miss any of those. There's enough tools out there to, to get rid of them. So, but this this is my favorite shot out of out of the group. Awesome. So what, before we head to uh, off of this one, mm -hmm. uh, one quick fog story from me, and then we'll go to the last one. So a right. uh, uh, few years back, if you remember our co-host we had on the regular JP Raw show, Kathleen, um, I was I had we lived close to each other, and I had gone out to shoot some some fog. Got up early, went out there to a uh, near pond, the pond that's in the area. Got all set up, you know, found my spot where I wanted to shoot. I was set up with my tripod. The fog, the sun was starting to come up and illuminating the fog, and like, oh, this is awesome. My phone rings, and it's it's Kathleen, and she <laughs> she proceeds to wants to talk for the next forty five minutes. And if you remember her on the show, stopping her was not easy. Um, so by the time was she, was she the uh, Spider Girl? Spider Girl. No. Was that the one where the spider, like, or the mouse? Ra the mouse, yes. Yes, that's Mouse. Her. Okay, yeah. it's the mouse girl. It's not Spider Mouse. Huh? She mouse. was a co-host for, a, for um, a dozen or two dozen shows. Anyway, by the time she finally got done with the conversation, there was just fog around the edges of the pond. And I took, I took the shot, and it turned out all right, but not what I wanted it to be. You got to um, – so the thing about any fog or any atmospheric things, um, somebody always told me that, like – so here's you want to go to the Grand Canyon and take an amazing like weather shot or you you know you can go and you'll try to plan your trip and you'll do all this kind of stuff but you know who's going to you're going to be so mad because the guy who lives a mile away from that place mm -hmm. is there every day yep and he gets to see it all and that's the thing you got to go to places all you know all the time and learn when the seasons are when the light is right when because these i know a local pond we've got a local pond that's got like willow trees all around it and everything it's gorgeous but unless it's a certain time of the year and the light is it a certain way and the fog is also there. Eh, it's just a pond. And so, you know, but I've learned over the years and I went and I did a 32 bit um, tutorial on my YouTube page that's called 32 bit HDR, a walk in the park. And I was there for, you know, I went because the light and everything was, was that, and it was just, you know, I knew what day to go uh, and what time of year. So yeah, it's, it's just keep going, keep trying. Yeah. That's, that's usually how you get it. All right, our last image is also another one that was submitted through the the web page, and I believe it is his first time submitting. Also, it is nice. Tim. Let's bring up the photo. It is uh, Tim. What's his last name? 
Schlerman. Schlerman. Tell Schlerman. Me Schlerman. Yeah. Uh, it's his first time submitting. He did it to the to the web page, and uh, it's a close up of I imagine his dog. <laughs> it is his dog, <laughs> and it says that uh, this is his high strung Wheaton Terrier named Jake. So awesome! Hi, Jake. How you doing? Um, you said he wanted to capture the. So first of all, you need a you need a sound effect for a, a home run and people cheering. <laughs> I do. Right? I need some sound um, effects. Yes. Because yes, because Tim, he hit the first time he stepped up to the plate. He hit it out of the park because he says, "I wanted to catch capture the moment of Jake being his hyper self as he tries to get a good view out the front windshield." Of course, he kept licking my lenses and trying to <laughs> and tried to focus the camera. Uh, as he tried to fo focus the camera. And uh, once he saw the photo in Lightroom, it looked much better as a black and white. Uh, I did some minor color changes, as you can see. See this? That's what I need to hear. Yeah. All right. So, funny dog, black and white. Um, I agree with the black and white. I don't agree with the selective color. Yeah. Ditch it all. Um, just go black and white. Because I don't think that... When I look at it, I see tongue and eye, <laughs> and it takes away from the whole story of this wonderful dog. Like you could just tell he's getting ready to go after that lens. I got it on several monitors as we're doing this, and I got yeah. as I glance around, I got to tell you, my eye goes straight to the tongue, and that's not yep. probably not where he wants me to go. It's probably that's more right. to the eye, but it is right. so it is so it contrasts so heavily from the rest of the image that boom, boom, when you go you go there, and I got to you. you I think all a lot of us photographers love to play with selective color from down, from time to time. Somewhere in our photography career, we love to play Me. with it, yep. and we keep hoping that this maybe you keep hoping this is the image where it's going to work. And I some, just did one. Sometimes it does. It's um, going to bite me because I don't know why. I, I it was a picture of a building in in there's a building in Milwaukee that has three giant like twenty foot ladybugs on the side of the building, and I made the whole image black and white except for the ladybugs. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and every day I look at it and I go, should I release it? No, I really shouldn't release it. I really should make a choice. It. There's something about it. But that the you ladybugs do it. <laughs> are red, you know, and you're like, I just want you to see the ladybugs. Yes. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just one of those things. Make sure that if you are going to do selective color that it really tells the story of – like for this, I probably – maybe the car in black and white and the just the dog in color. Ah, that would idea. have really totally just been like – because, you know, dog sees in black and white. This mm -hmm. whole, puts me in the dog's head. Um, so, yeah. But I think if you're going to go black and white here, which would have been fine all by itself, I think you just go black and white with it. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderfully light uh, photo as far as, like, lighthearted. You nailed the focus on the eye. I think is, it looks pretty good um, from what I can see here. Uh, I can't zoom in on it, but it looks pretty good to me. Um, so kudos to you for that, for uh, getting Jake to keep his, you know, paws off the focus ring for a little bit. And then you're in a moving car, it looks like, on top of that, which is always fun to try to focus in. Well, it looks like if I can – it looks like a hand on the steering wheel, so maybe he was a passenger. Yeah. The yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Otherwise, I want to see the photo pulled back a little bit and see how he did it. But not, yeah. yeah, I think he was a passenger, and it looks like Jake was in between the seats. I think. And if you're um, if you're a dog lover like me, when you look at a dog photo, it looks like they're always smiling and in a great mood. And I can't yep. even you know even I, I'm not a big fan of here of the red tongue. I can't look at this photo and not smile. Right. Uh, absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. This he nailed it with all of that. So I think this. Um, Overall is good. Just lose the selective color or go color. But I think, I think just black and white. I yeah. think you you were part of the way there, and hopefully maybe that's that's the reason you know that we're doing uh, this personal critique for you is just to help you uh, with that. So yeah, yeah, awesome image. I like it. Very good. All right, that was the last one. Ad, very good. A lot of fun. It went. It it we went more than an hour, but it was uh, oh. great information. Information. So. We do have to pick um, who who we want as the winner for this time. Mm. So if you're mm. first time watching Mark or Daryl or whoever else, I need to make a list. This is number four, so we don't give it to the same person twice. Yeah. Um, but if you your first time watching, what you'll win, let me pull this up, is an item from A.D. Wheeler's store. 
Hmm. I can pick if you want, but I know I've picked the last three times. So I'll Heck, pick one. I, I, although last time I think we both agreed on who the person was. I think I'd like to pick Rolf Jensen this time. Oh, very good. I think that it, that that the Lightroom presets will give him a new creative uh, thought process on on. I thought the image uh, that he presented, which uh, was the lake and the two rocks and the mountains in the background, um, was a little flat. And I okay. think that a little little color fun in there might be something that helps him out a little bit. So yeah, that's my pick. Very good, awesome. So Rolf, I'll uh, send you a message and get that started. Thanks, AD, for hanging out with us, giving us this critique for free, and giving Anytime. away a prize. Look at that. Anytime. That's, that's awesome. So um, be sure to check out AD's website because he has a lot. We're giving, we're doing the Lightroom thing, but he has a whole lot of other items on there. You can follow AD over on his website, which is theexplorographer.com. And there he has links to all the social networks, Facebook, uh, Google+, Twitter. Kishash, you have everything there. YouTube. I just personally <laughs> yeah. watched, you did a, what, a three-part series on your new storage server, which yeah. I, I know yep. a lot of, some photographers like you and me are, uh, you know, tech geeks too. Some are not, but AD did a really good review of his new storage server, which, hey, if you're taking a lot of photos, you need the storage. Uh, so, so check out his YouTube page. Check out his, his uh, website, too. And I, this will be up on YouTube. Daryl oh, mentioned that he came in a little late and he wanted to know if it was being recorded. I am recording it. I'll have it up on YouTube uh, shortly, a couple days or whatever. And then it will be out in its own separate podcast later on, too. And I think Facebook keeps it here. So yep. we have it there, too. All right, everybody. That's the end. We'll see you in a month. We do these once a month. Good night. Bye.